Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machida. And this is part two of our continuing series on how a small unknown group of uh, Protestants were able to overthrow the form of the Protestant Bible as it had been accepted within Protestantism for centuries. And in the last video, we saw how this small minority of uh, Scottish Bible societies were able to basically flip uh, all Protestants, regardless of whatever their beliefs were about these books or whatever their practice was, to have apocrypha-less Bibles or smaller Protestant Bibles. And we showed how some Protestant theologians, also uh, very prominent theologians indeed, whitewashed the reaction of when the British and Foreign Bible Society had cut off all funding to all Protestant uh, societies who wished to continue printing the Bibles as they had been since the time of Luther. Now, if you haven't seen part one, I highly recommend that you stop right here, go to part one, watch that first before continuing today. Now, it started with the British and Foreign Bible Society. The Edinburgh Bible Society was the prime mover. But what happened was there was a huge backlash that occurred once this ultimatum was given. Protestants simply did not want to change the way they received the Bible since, uh, like I said, since the time of Luther. And it took decades of consistent work by uh, these Bible societies to ultimately overthrow that traditional use of the traditional Protestant Bible. In fact, it goes into the early 1900s, as we shall see in this series, for the new cut, the smaller Bible, to become the majority, and not just the majority, but to actually eradicate memory of how Protestant Bibles used to be, and so that Today, you have many Protestants who have incomplete Bibles that they're totally unaware of that uh, simply is not the same as those founded in the early Reformation. Now, in this episode, what I'd like to do is I'd like to concentrate on the main reasons argued by the prime mover behind this movement, the Edinburgh Bible Society. What was their reasons for being so dead set against traditional Protestant Bibles, and why was it that they thought it a necessity that all Protestant Bibles should not have the so-called Apocrypha in it? And I think uh, many of you will be shocked at some of the reasons. So that's what we're going to look at here in part two of our series on the um, eradication of the so-called Apocrypha from Protestant Bibles. So fasten your seatbelts, folks, because the Apocrypha Apocalypse is beginning right now. First, we must address this question. Uh, the uh, Apocrypha controversy that erupted in the early 1800s was not over the canonicity of the Deuteral Canon. That matter had been settled since Luther did his flip-flop back in 1519 at the Leipzig Disputation. And from that point on, Protestants would not allow these books to be held equal to canonical books. Uh, so the issue of the canon was non-issue. It was just assumed by all that the so-called Apocrypha was not canonical. So no surprise there. Although, as we have noted, there was a wide variety of opinions amongst Protestants as to how the so-called Apocrypha related to the uh, canonical scripture and their relative value. Some, especially amongst Lutherans and also High Church Anglicans, saw these books as some sense being scripture, in some sense being part of the Old Testament, although they're not inspired and they're not canonical. They were holy writings and valuable for all Christians to read and to uh, model their uh, lives after. That was for the uh, Lutheran High Church uh, segment. However, for the Low Church, the uh, uh, Scottish, the Reformed, uh, they had a very low view of the so-called Apocrypha. 
Uh, in fact, uh, as we noted in the previous episode, the Westminster Confession basically says that the uh, so-called Apocrypha is no better than any other human writing, and it has really no special place. Well, for some people, that was even too high of a view. In fact, they viewed that the Deuterocanon, which is called the Apocrypha, was in some sense even worse than some human writings and indeed positively dangerous. Now, uh, let's start with a quote. Now, I'm going to be giving lots of quotes from the Edinburgh Bible Society committee notes. So the Edinburgh Bible Society was part of the Scottish societies that were the movers and shakers trying to stop the British Forum Bible Society from supporting any Protestant group that wished to con continue printing the Protestant Bible like it had been since Luther and to get rid of the Apocrypha and extinguish its memory. Uh, so they're really important. So I'm going to give you a series of quotations from these uh, committee notes. They're very hard to get a hold of. In fact, uh, I had access to them by actually traveling to Wales and going to the National Library and photocopying uh, the committee notes from this. So this is directly from their argumentation. So this first quote I want to give is basically the statement in regards to the canonicity of the so-called Apocrypha. Again, uh, no major fireworks here. Uh, this is something that uh, was already uh, discussed, but I think it'll kind of set the tone as to uh, what the Edinburgh Bible Society saw these books as, and also lay the groundwork for its later, um, the, the, the later comments that we'll see in regards to the committee notes. The Apocrypha is no part of the Word of God. We are aware that it may be quite lawful for us to propagate many things, which are not inspired. But to these, we should make the same objection, and hold it good, because when we send them interspersed with the Bible, or in company with it, so as to arrogate the same authority which it possesses, and claim the same submission which it demands, we corrupt the holy communication of heaven, we put the wisdom, or it may be the folly, of man on a level with the unerring counsels of God, and we so far endeavor to counteract the effect, as well as degrade the character, of divine revelation. This maxim applies to the ablest and the purest of mere human productions, and to say that least of it, we see nothing in the Apocrypha which for us to know that it is not the word of God, to satisfy us that we do wrong, and commit sin, when we give it to any of our fellow creatures, under the designation, or wearing on it appearance, of the word of God. Now here's something that's very ironic about this statement. Now remember, since the time of Luther, the Deuterocanon had been collected into an appendix and placed between the Old and the New Testament. It was segregated from the rest of the scripture, although it was included in the Old Testament. But nevertheless, there was a warning page where it was labeled as Apocrypha, warning Protestant readers that these are not to be held equal to canonical scripture, but they're good and useful to be read. And that was followed by all other uh, Protestant translations, including English translations, uh, although there was some variety in there. And we spoke about how the Council of Dort moves that appendix to the back of the Bible. So it's interesting that here the Edinburgh Bible Society believes that this is not enough, that this is just too dangerous to even have these books within the covers of Protestant Bibles. And they make the charge that somehow by producing the Bibles like Luther had, that that is arrogating some sort of uh, authority from the canonical books is very interesting because they're kind of charging Luther and uh, Kelvin and everybody who followed afterwards with a kind of um, endangerment or maybe like a heresy that somehow, even though they denied the authority of these books, just by including them in Protestant Bibles, somehow uh, they're giving them authority that they don't normally uh, would ex exist. But let's continue on, though, because the committee notes continue, and you'll see specifically what they're talking about. 
strike at the root of some of the fundamental truths which God has revealed for the instruction and salvation of man. Now, one of the main issues that the Edinburgh Bible Society had against the so-called Apocrypha was that they very clearly contain doctrine, certain teachings that were at odds with Protestant theology, especially intercession of the saints, purgatory, almsgiving uh, for the atonement of sins, and that good works justify amongst a few. And this is explicitly stated uh, by this society. So they're very explicit that these books teach these particular doctrines. This is very ironic, because now that these books have been removed from Protestant Bibles and their memory has been forgotten, you will have, and I have encountered many Protestants, I'm not going to name names, who claim that the Deuterocanon actually doesn't teach purgatory and doesn't teach these things, which is very strange, because why would the Edinburgh Bible Society want to get rid of these books because they teach these doctrines. Then once these books are removed, then all of a sudden there's this denial that they ever taught it. Well, you can't have it both ways. It's either they teach it or they don't. Apparently, you know, the prime movers in removing these books from Protestant Bibles believed, yes, indeed, they do teach certain particular Catholic teachings that are at odds with Protestant theology. A second admission that these committee notes make is something that I think would surprise a lot of people. So let's go to hear the committee note. Great indeed is the demerit of that book which contradicts the revealed will of God, but its demerit is unspeakably aggravated when it adds the blasphemous assumption of being itself a revelation of God's will. Now such is the Apocrypha. It pretends to a divine original. Some, it is true, have denied this, and published their denial. No one, however, who has read the Apocrypha can fail to perceive that the denial is founded in ignorance and inattention. So plainly does it affect to have the sanction of heaven, that it actually apes the phraseology of inspiration. It contains messages to mankind which are sometimes represented as proceeding immediately from God himself, and sometimes as conveyed through the medium of angels and frequently its declarations are introduced with that most awful and authoritative of all sanctions, thus saith the Lord. This is very interesting. Here the committee says, one of the reasons why these books has to come out, first, they teach Catholic doctrine. Second, they present themselves as if they are inspired scripture. And it talks about how in a number of different ways the Deuterocanon presents itself as if it's the Word of God, it's inspired scripture, it pretends to be a divine original, and it's, it, they can see that there are some Protestants who will deny this, but nevertheless it says that no one, however, who has read the Apocrypha can fail to perceive that denial is founded in ignorance and inattention. Because it so plainly does it affect to have the sanction of heaven that actually apes the phraseology of inspiration. And it goes on that, you know, it conveys messages from God to man and through the medium of angels and so on and so forth. Very interesting that these books present themselves as if they are divine scripture. Once again, once these books are removed from Protestant Bibles and their memory is forgotten, over and over again, you'll see this on the internet and social media, the claim that the so-called Apocrypha never claims to be inspired, never claims to be scripture, on and on and on. So once these books are safely removed, guess what? There's a denial that they pretend to be scripture, when actually the Edinburgh Bible Society, the, the Scots, all of them are saying the exact opposite, that this is dangerous because they actually seem to be scripture. They present themselves as scripture. Now, if you take the first part, they teach Catholic doctrine, and you take the second part, they present themselves as the inspired word of God, then you combine the two and you find out, at least according to the logic of the Edinburgh Bible Society, that there is a danger that 
people could, by reading books with the so-called apocrypha in it, become Catholic. Yes, very dangerous. In fact, the committee goes on to say, Again, if they are Protestants among whom the Apocrypha is to be dispersed, it does not on that account lose its qualities of falsehood, absurdity, and blasphemy, we account it no sin to be instrumental in deliberately circulating that, which endangers the souls of men and insults the honor of God, and as sent to those who have been emancipated from the darkness and superstition of popery. It implies an endeavor on our part, not to perfect and perpetuate their emancipation, but to continue them in the errors that still envelope their minds, or to send them back to the thraldom from which they had happily escaped. So Protestants who read the Bible just as Martin Luther and the Reformers had left it to uh, Protestantism, they are in danger of becoming Catholic, because if they are reading these books and they're presenting themselves as sacred scripture, some Protestants might become Catholic, or even worse, some Catholics who uh, became Protestant might go back to Catholicism. Very interesting. In fact, this was not um, some theoretical aspect, but they actually believe this was the case with the Toulouse edition of Scripture. And uh, so here is what it says about this particular edition. With respect to the Protestants also, the circulation of the Apocrypha is inexpedient. Such of them in France, even though they were better informed on the subject, they may peruse it with some portion of those reverent impressions with which they peruse the inspired books, and, of course, not only to imbibe the erroneous notions which it inculcates, but to lose that exclusive submission to the Word of God which is so dutiful and so becoming. An example of this is to be found in Mr. Chabron's correspondence relative to the Toulouse edition of the Bible. He objected to the edition of the Apocrypha because there was danger of the Protestant confounding the Apocryphal with the canonical books, and of their being thus led to adopt some of the errors of popery, particularly that of purgatory, this is the natural, and will be the frequent, effect of circulating the Bible containing the Apocrypha. But how well founded is it that the traditional Protestant Bible would make Protestants become Catholic and former Catholics come back to the church. Now, in part one, we read from uh, the Apocrypha and Ecumenical Perspective by UBS in an article written by Wilhelm Gerdert. Remember, he pointed out that this was not the experience of Protestants on the continent, especially in Germany. And he writes, the newly founded German Bible societies printed and distributed exclusively Luther Bibles with the Apocrypha, as had been the custom since Luther's time. The churches considered only Bibles with the Apocrypha as complete Bibles. They were not conscious of the problem that, in practice, Old Testament deuterocanonical and canonical writings were thus placed on the same footing. Indeed, if you think about it, the Protestant Bible with this so-called Apocrypha had been in print and circulated for centuries. So why is it now, you know, here in the 1820s, that all of a sudden there's this danger about Protestants becoming Catholic and that, that the format that the Reformers left the Bible is just too dangerous for us to continents anymore? Why is it that uh, they're so alarmed? Well, it, it apparently was centered only in regards to the uh, Scottish Bible societies and their tussle with the British and foreign Bible societies. As uh, Wilhelm Gerdet notes, uh, such was not the case in Germany and elsewhere. Uh, there was no problems and no awareness of any problems with the traditional format of Protestant Bibles. The committee notes continue and say, that practice judicious or wise, which, instead of confirming or improving the principles of those who have, in a Catholic country, embraced or been educated in the Protestant faith, threatens to darken what had been made light, to corrupt what had been reformed, and, in any measure, to pave the way for backsliding or apostasy, but the evil of circulating the Apocrypha as a part of the Scripture volume is not limited to those Protestants who get the book to peruse, it is also injurious to the minds of Protestants, who, merely see or know that such a union and such a circulation are permitted. 
So here you have, they, they practically call the traditional Protestant Bible evil because it included the Apocrypha so-called between its covers. There's also an interesting uh, position here too in regards to the reform position that scripture is auto-attesting, that it's self-attesting, that you can discern or the average person with the Holy Spirit can discern what is scripture and what is not scripture. If that's really true, then how is it that there could be such confusion amongst Reformed Protestants who read the Protestant Bible like it had always been printed? In other words, is it really auto-attesting or not? Because if it's auto-attesting, then there really isn't a danger of people confusing the so-called Apocrypha with the rest of the Bible, especially if it's in the format that Luther uh, or the Council of or Synod of Dort left it, namely as part of an appendix or the warning on it, right? Apparently that was just not good enough. And even though supposedly through auto-attesting, through self-attesting nature, their Holy Spirit witnessing with our spirit that it is the word of God, apparently not a great test because according to the very people who are trying to advocate for the removal of these books, they can't tell the difference. People can't tell the difference. People are becoming Catholic. Protestants are becoming Catholic. Catholics are returning to the church. Oh, my, because these books are in the format in which they were historically given. Sorry for being a little facetious, but it's hard not to get angry when you're reading this. But you have to ask yourself, why at this point in history in the 1820s is it so alarming that the Protestant Bible has to shed itself of these books and take on a brand new format that really was not part of their heritage. Why is this so important? Why is there an urgency? Well, the following committee notes basically explain why. By sending them the Apocrypha, we are, in fact, abetting the Church of Rome, in an impious attempt to establish the inspiration of that spurious document, and seconding her efforts to compel those who acknowledge her spiritual dominion, to listen to its lying wonders as to the voice of the Almighty. Now, anti-Catholics today often charge that the Council of Trent added these books in reaction to the Protestant Reformation. But you can see here, it's actually the other way around. These books are being removed from Protestant Bibles in reaction to uh, the Council of Trent. That's really the mover and shaker. And indeed, this is a point that the Edinburgh Bible Society hammers over and over again in its committee notes. So it is a veritable crusade to rid Protestant Bibles of all vestiges of the so-called Apocrypha, specifically because Catholicism considered them ca canonical at Trent. Consider this uh, rather lengthy statement from the committee. It is countenancing and supporting the Church of Rome in her system of imposition. She, by her decree, has made that canonical which is uncanonical, and compelled the people to receive as the word of God what is only the word of man. And the London Committee, in name of the British and Foreign Bible Society, and of all who have contributed to its funds, instead of resisting that act of spiritual despotism and delusion by which she props up her power, helps and encourages her to persist in it. She can, perhaps, check the circulation and the perusal of the Bible, but she can tell the people at the same time, and they will have too good reason to believe her, that the Protestants themselves believe in the divinity of those passage which she brings from the Apocrypha, to establish the doctrine of purgatory, and of the saving merit of good works. And she will plead from what has been done, as far as Protestant authority can be of any weight, that her decrees can make any sayings or doctrines which she chooses to fix upon, tantamount to a revelation from heaven. And thirdly, when Protestants give the Apocrypha intermixed with the Scriptures, they excite the contempt of the Papists, instead of securing either their respect or their gratitude. 
the papists must conclude either that the Protestants are altogether indifferent to the canon of scripture, which would be discreditable, both to their piety and their judgment, or that, believing the Apocrypha to be a mere human composition, they yet are guilty of so much duplicity as to give under the form and appearance of having a divine original. Now there's lots of uh, very interesting things in this particular section of the committee notes that I'd like to call your attention to. First, um, notice that it's in reaction to the Council of Trent that supposedly Trent had decreed and made canonical things that aren't canonical and compel people to receive the word of God. That is only the words of men. Well, in this channel, you well know that throughout Christian history, these books were called scripture. They used the confirmed doctrine. And since the fourth century, they were listed as part of the church law, as canonical scripture, yada, yada, yada. So that aside, let's move on. Uh, so it says that the London Committee, in the name of the British and Foreign Bible Society, uh, have all contributed in its funds instead of resisting the act of spiritual despotism and delusion by, uh, by which she props up her authority. In other words, instead of using this philanthropic organization to promote Protestantism and to undercut and destroy Catholicism, it rather the British and Foreign Bible Society by allowing Protestants to continue to use their Bible and print their Bible like they always did, um, has failed to check uh, Catholicism. And again, it reasserts what we talked about before, that if Protestants start reading these books as if they're inspired scripture, guess what? They're going to start believing in things like purgatory and merit and good works and all sorts of stuff. And that, of course, is anathema to Protestantism. Um, again, the assertion that these, thing, these books actually teach these particular uh, things. Many Protestants today, especially with the teaching about purgatory, is denied. Yet here, this is the main reason why they need to get out of Protestant Bibles. It, also, another very interesting note. It says that Protestants give the Apocrypha intermixed with scriptures. They excite the contempt of the papists. And uh, they either look like they're indifferent to the canon of scripture, or they don't believe that the Apocrypha is mere human um, compositions. This is very interesting. I see their point here, okay? Because if, it, if Protestant Bibles actually had their books intermix like had taken place in the most ancient Christian Bibles. I'm talking about the great codices of the fourth and fifth century with no distinction or qualification, just like the earliest Bibles. That would signal that these books are on par with the rest of the proto-canon. This is something I've been arguing in this channel. Notice here the Edinburgh Bible Society sees the implications of not putting all these books into an appendix and segregating them and distinguishing them from the proto-canon. This has some very serious implications, which the Edinburgh Bible Society picks up. And it basically says that such a Bible, like the most ancient Christian Bibles, either didn't care about the canon, which is, of course, ridiculous, or that they saw these books as actually being on par on the same footing as the proto-canon, that is a huge admission. And of course, they're focusing only on um, uh, these Protestant Bible societies printing these books in there and mixing them, which was probably done for Catholic countries that otherwise wouldn't have accepted these Bibles. Um, but nevertheless, notice that the implication is very clear. The only thing is they don't think about well, what does this imply about the earliest Christians in the 4th and 5th century that their Bibles didn't make the distinction that Martin Luther and the other ministerial Protestants uh, insist on, that these are to be segregated and not be held equal? 
It is against the will of God that there be circulated for the word of God, the doctrines and commandments of men. The papists do circulate the apocrypha as the word of God, and we are their agents. In fact, if we furnish them with the means of doing so. By contributing, therefore, we become partakers of other men's sins. Notice here. If we continue to print Protestant Bibles like they have been since the time of Luther, we are agents of Rome. That is the message. And you can see here, it's very clear. This is anti-Catholicism being focused. But why now? Why is it that the Edinburgh Bible Society is making all these claims at this particular junction in history? Well, as we continue, we'll get the answer. Here's another committee statement. In the face of all such sophistry, we recur again to the obligation under which we lie, to do nothing against the truth, and everything for the truth, and to the unassailable position that the Apocrypha, impiously pretends to be a portion of God's holy word, and is employed by the Church of Rome, to support the delusions of him, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Once again, if you continue to have Bibles as Luther had left them, you're, you are going along with Rome. Here's yet another statement. And it is well that they have been so frankly avowed, because it makes us aware of the danger, and enables us to lift the voice of warning, ere it be too late, for rescuing the Bible Society from that apocryphal contamination which has so long and so inveterately cleaved to it, and which threatens to render it, while its present management continues, not an instrument of Protestant benevolence, but an engine of popish error and superstition. Notice that the main goal, according to these um, committee statements, is not to propagate the word of God far and wide. It's really to propagate Protestantism. That's how they view these Bible societies that the Bible societies were Protestant instruments to, uh, to uh, spread far and wide Protestant theology. And that's why this very last line is so important, because it says that if the British are going to allow these Bibles to be produced, it's not an instrument of Protestant benevolence, but an engine of popish error and superstition. In other words, this is sectarian. This is Protestantism against Catholicism. It's not spreading the word of God, spreading the gospel. That is the main thrust of these committee statements. So again, what brings up, well, why now? Why the 1820s, not the 1720s, 1620s? Why not the end of the 15th century? Why is it the 1820s? Why is it that the uh, Edinburgh Bible Society sees this right now as the time, the decisive moment in which Protestants have to get rid of their historic Bible and have an incomplete Bible sanitized of the Deuterocanon. Well, this next committee statement, I think, gives you an idea. But we could call the attention of our readers in a particular manner, to the fine opportunity afforded by the British and Foreign Bible Society, constituted as it is, for introducing a more exclusive, and decided, and general attachment to the pure canon of Scripture. It was a great step, when the Apocrypha books were taken out of the Bible, and placed by themselves with the Apocryphal title, but this was only a step, and it still remained a desideratum to get quit of them, altogether and to keep the pure word of God, detached in every respect from their contaminating fellowship. This, we believe to have been an object of anxious desire with many good and enlightened men at the time of the Reformation, though circumstances discouraged them from attempting to accomplish it. Okay, two things to note about this particular statement. The first is the answer to our question, why now? It's because the Scottish understand that this is a perfect opportunity, given the financial strength of the British and Foreign Bible Societies and all their associate societies, to alter the format of Protestant Bibles across the board, that they has become very influential in terms of deciding 
under what format and what can be in the Bible and what cannot be in the Bible and uh, to restrict Bibles down to those incomplete Bibles without the Deuteral Canon. This was a huge opportunity, as this committee note actually says, that uh, it, this is a moment in time that they can produce what they believed was the pure canon of Scripture. And the second thing to note, which I find very interesting, is this admission that Protestantism had always wanted to get rid of these books, but it didn't. And this, I think, for any thoughtful Protestant, really should give a moment of pause. If these books are not canonical, they're not inspired, why weren't they uh, jettisoned from the Bible completely? Why didn't Martin Luther in his German translation just omit these books? And all Protestant Bibles omit these books from the very beginning. Why retain them? Well, according to the committee, that this was the desire was to get rid of these books initially, but circumstances simply didn't allow it. Or to put it exactly as they put it, the circumstances discouraged them from attempting to accomplish it. So why did Protestants retain the so-called Apocrypha? And I think we're going to stop right there because that's a really good in question. And it's one that uh, comes up frequently. Why didn't they get rid of these books? Why did they wait until the 1820s uh, to get rid of these books? And actually, it isn't even accomplished till the 1900s when a majority of Protestant Bibles uh, simply didn't have these books around anymore. So we're going to stop right there. And in part three, we'll pick up with that question and other ones that I think uh, is very interesting. So thank you so much for watching. By the way, if you enjoyed this program, please like it. And if you haven't, please subscribe to the channel. Also, William Albrecht and myself are on Patreon. We appreciate your support. It enables us to buy material and access things that otherwise we wouldn't be able to in order to provide programs like this. So until next time, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.